But the Bible, I think, lays out pretty clear what those things are. Where you have to put some, that wicked person away from you. Someone's an idolater or a drunkard or an extortioner. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you know, there's other grievous sins that people could commit. We're going to say, yeah, you know, you shouldn't have done that. That's wicked. And I'm going to call it out as such. But I'm not going to listen to all these little rumors and things and little blasts because what they're trying to do is make your mind evil affected against those people. And they work at you and they spin it in a way to just make you think like, oh man, wow, this person's really, he's really trying to do something bad. And people get all hung up on that. You know what? I'm going to stand with my friends until if something comes out and there's, there's good evidence for it and, and I, it's, it's reasonable to assume as in your know, church looks into it and says, you know what? No, we, this person, these accusations are, are legit. Then I'm going to say, okay, I'll stand with that and I'll stand with the church's judgment and I'll stand on the word of God and any man is capable of falling. Obviously, we don't want to lift any one person above that which is right and just, just elevate people to a status that becomes cult-like and just, and, and, oh, this person could do no wrong. No, everybody can do wrong. It's not an undying faith to man. But at the same time, I don't want to just leave a good man of God out in the dust because there's people that hate him trying to, to make minds evil affected against him. So we need to have that, that proper balance. Now, where this goes too far is what we've seen recently with, uh, with everything going on with the Cameron Giovanelli case, which was a Baptist pastor who uh, pled guilty to having a relationship with a teenager, a sexual relationship with a teenager that was in his church. He pled guilty to that. He is an abuser. He is someone who, who took advantage of his position and took advantage of a young girl in his congregation. And it's a wicked thing to do. He's a wicked man. And he deserves a punishment that he's going to get. And that needs to be called out and not just swept under the rug. Right, right, that's right. And we can't hide those things. It's not going to do church any good to hide that stuff. When it happens, it needs to be exposed. They need to be dealt with appropriately. And they need to be out. And people need to understand this is not acceptable in church. It's not going to be tolerated. And when you have this culture of sweeping things under the rug, it just makes church that much more dangerous. Because right. right. those people don't belong in a church. They don't belong behind a pole. They don't belong in a church at all. Amen. You need to put away that person from among you. It's a wicked person. We're not going to hide it. That's the Catholic Church's MO. They shuffle these priests around to different churches. Look, that ought not to be happening in Baptist churches. Now, obviously, there's going to be people that creep in privily, unawares. The Bible teaches us that in the book of Jude. There are wolves in sheep's clothing. They put on the sheep's outfit and they try to make themselves look like they're one of us. But inwardly, they're ravening wolves and they're out to seek and destroy and do all this damage. And sometimes they get through. But you know what? When they're caught, when they're found out, we don't need to be covering up for them. They need to be shown, hey, this is a wolf. He's out. Unfortunately, though, you've got a whole bunch of Baptist churches that are supporting the wolf and not supporting the victims. And that's wicked and that's wrong. But see, that's where you take things too far of standing with who you think is a man of God. Look, it, it's already come out. The church, and see, the church had already decided that he was guilty before the court system did. I was done and, and decided on it when the church made its decision. Because they didn't just receive an accusation blindly. They did their research the way that they're supposed to do. They diligently sought out and they, and they interviewed, they talked to people. They, they did everything they were supposed to do and handled it appropriately and came to a conclusion. And you know what? It just so happened to coincide with the guilty plea that the man actually of his own word, just, you know, pled guilty to charges of these things that happened. That's not acceptable. That's where you, you know, that is definitely an easy line, line in the sand to draw. It's like, yeah, I'm not going to stand with that person. If you do something really wicked, I'm not going to stand with you. I can't. Because I have to have integrity to Jesus Christ and to the word of God. 
But if it's some, if it's some minor thing and people are just, you know, what was it with Jesus Christ? The false witnesses said, well, he said that he could destroy the temple and build it again in three days. Now, first of all, he didn't say that. He was referring to his body. He said, if he said, he said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up again. But he didn't say, I'm going to destroy the temple and rebuild, which is what they said, right? He didn't say that. But even if he did, right, it's kind of like, what a stupid accusation. Oh, yeah, that's going to make me not stand with Jesus anymore because they said that. It's like, come on. They put him to death over it. 